This is me nearly three years ago now. I was completely fresh into FPV drones, had no idea what gear to buy, and knew no tricks to help me learn as fast as possible. Since then, I have tried multiple different flying techniques and learned from the best of the best by interviewing the most experienced pilots the FPV hobby has to offer, taking my flying skills from this to this. So in today's video, I'll be showing you what the best equipment is to buy right now, how absolutely anyone from any skill level can get started, and also a few of my favorite tricks that I wish I'd found out earlier. But first, I'm gonna show you just how easy it is to get started in the FPV hobby, and for a lot of you, you're probably gonna be able to get started right now without even leaving your house. All you need to do is grab a gaming controller like a PlayStation or an Xbox, plug it into your computer, download the liftoff simulator, and get started with the beginner course. No need for anything fancy, just a gaming controller and a computer. However, if you're already serious about getting out there and actually flying, you're gonna need some equipment. The harsh reality here though is if you did what I did and actually buy gear that you really didn't need, there's probably a good chance you're gonna quit the hobby before you even get started. Everything I had heard pointed me towards getting a controller and hopping on a simulator, so I went and grabbed myself the cheapest controller to get going with it all. Unfortunately, this didn't quite work out the way that I thought it might, and so through a whole lot of trial and error, I found the one FPV controller that I wish I'd bought at first. A massive issue that I faced getting started with FPV was remote controllers. I went through multiple controllers, multiple brands, weeks of researching and watching reviews, all to end up settling with the one controller that I wish I had brought from the start. The RadioMaster TX16S with Hall Sensor Gimbal. This controller is pretty much perfect with only three things that I believe holds it back, but we'll get to those soon. First up, I am very aware of the pricing barrier. I started off with the Emacs Tiny Hawk 2 ready to fly kit. It came with the controller, goggles, drone, and batteries, all for I think about $430. And when comparing that to how much the TX16 costs, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's not much difference. But it was at this exact point in time that I made the mistake of deciding that I didn't just want to spend that amount of money on just a controller. And I say mistake because at the end of it all, I ended up spending quite a bit more than I could have. My first controller sucked and I kind of expected it to because I bought a fairly budget ready to fly kit. That controller was called the Emacs E6 and to buy it on its own it would be around $50. So again, I wasn't too surprised. Although I definitely was a bit bummed out that the gimbal broke after just five hours of use. I hadn't even taken the quad out for its first flight at this point as I was making sure to nail the initial learning curve of FPV. So I literally needed a new controller to keep going. This is when I went on my hunt for the best budget friendly controller for FPV. After a lot of research, I ended up finding the Beta FPV Light Radio 2. Now, this one had a lot of positive things going for it with reviews saying it's literally one of the best budget controllers on the market. So I purchased it, spent around $100, and got excited to receive it so I could keep practicing on the simulator. Upon opening the controller up, it immediately had a really premium feel to it. The gimbals actually felt solid and of much higher quality than the Emacs ones, and even the packaging was fairly nice too. So I genuinely thought I'd hit the jackpot and that this was gonna be the one that I'd use for a while. But I was, uh, I was wrong. <laughs> Super wrong. It literally took less than one hour in the simulator for the left hand gimbal to start twitching around. So this inspired me to send an email to Kiwi Quads, who I had brought the controller through, and they came back with an email saying that they were aware of this issue and would send me a replacement gimbal to plug in. Long story short, I got the gimbal, replaced it, and then started to use it again. Not more than two hours later, the left hand gimbal started to twitch. Now, I want to be real clear here. I was not being rough with the controller, and I really did want it to work. At this point though, these controller issues had put a real damper on my whole FPV experience and I was beginning to give up on it a little bit if I'm being honest. This was one of those moments where I really felt on the fence. I could let FPV go and say it wasn't for me, or I could get another controller and give it one last try. I decided that there was no reward without a little bit of risk, so I researched around and found a seemingly bulletproof controller the RadioMaster TX16S. It was well out of my price range and I seriously did not want to spend the money, but I came to the resolution that if I bought this expensive controller and ended up not enjoying FPV, I could at least sell it and get most of my money back. So as you probably guessed, I pulled the trigger, bought the TX16S for $420, nearly the same price as the whole Emacs Tiny Hawk kit, but I got it ordered. To make things easy for you to understand here too, I still have this controller. It's, it's sitting right here. It's my main controller. It's been over 18 months and I haven't had the need to buy another controller at all. I've used it for long range cinematics, high intensity professional jobs, and even some light freestyle. So like I said before, this is pretty much the perfect controller. 
Pretty much is exactly that, however. So let's cover what's holding it back. Firstly, this was one of the most painful and complicated things I have ever had to do in my life. Okay, like maybe not quite, but to set up and link this controller to the drone, wow. It's painful, man. Like, it took me hours upon hours to even find a tutorial that was actually good and easy to understand. And even now to this day, I couldn't confidently tell you how to set this thing up. You can't just press a link button to have the controller set up. Instead, you need to tell the controller what each of the stick movements do. You can't just flick the switch and then map it to beta flight because first, you need to go to the switch on the controller and tell the controller what happens when you flick the switch. I've linked the tutorial down below that I used. Hopefully it can be of help to you, but yeah, just know that this was one son of a to set up. Secondly, I'm feeling like I'm missing out a little bit with the fact that it doesn't work with DJI FPV drones like the Avada or DJI FPV. Obviously, this isn't Radio Master's fault as DJI have their own proprietary systems and don't allow for third-party connections. But if flying DJI FPV drones is of interest to you, you're going to have to own their controller, which you're going to have to fork out another $200 for. Finally, the only thing that I honestly don't like about the controller that actively affects me on a day-to-day -day basis is its size. On one hand, it's really nice to have a large controller that feels weighty and solid as this helps me to fly confidently. On the other hand, however, the second I want to travel anywhere with my FPV drone, I have to try and fit this phone case in somewhere, or even if I'm roughing it, this massive controller. It also makes it significantly hard for me to hold without a lanyard, so I generally find myself sitting down and resting the controller on my leg. So I get it, you're strung up between spending a decent amount of cash on a controller or just trying your luck with a cheaper alternative. Take my past experiences as proof and just know that if you do take the cheaper route, you're most likely putting yourself up for months of frustration and you could highly hurt your FPV experience as a whole. That now leaves us with a choice of goggles. And I mean, I started off with a really cheap, crappy pair of analog goggles and they were okay. But since then I've moved on to DJI's digital system, which is effectively at the point now where it looks like you're flying through the lens of a GoPro. It's pretty damn insane. And because of that, I would genuinely recommend that anyone getting their first pair of goggles goes for the DJI Goggles Integra. They're about 500 US dollars, which is certainly an investment, but one that will last you for many, many years to come. If that's out of your budget right now though, I'd honestly just go for something a fifth of the price like the Emax Transporter 2 goggles. Just don't expect them to, I don't know, have good range, a quality screen, or a great battery life. In fact, they're probably gonna have a whole bunch of things that annoy the hell out of you, but, but at the very least, they're gonna allow you to fly true FPV, and that's what matters here. The final thing to really consider, though, is your choice of drone. It's potentially the most important part, right? I've been through and still have a ton of different FPV drones, but if I could only pick one to have forever, it would be this one, without question. Over the last year and a half, I've owned three different FPV drones from Micro to CineWoop to Freestyle Cinematic. But there has only been one drone that I truly cannot fault, and that drone is the Nazgul Evoke F5. I covered my first impressions of it over a year ago, and to sum it up, I fucking love this drone. To start giving you a bit of an idea of why, about seven months ago I had a serious crash where the drone ended up free falling straight out of the sky and landed directly onto solid concrete. Not only did it have the weight of a 1300 milliamp hour battery, on it, but it also had a full GoPro Hero 10 and no joke, the only thing that happened after the impact was the need for a recalibration of the accelerometer. I mean honestly, the motors were fine, the frame was fine, not one single thing broke. Now, when I'm not crashing it, believe it or not, I do actually manage to fly it quite a lot. Now, I've flown this quad over a hundred times, which I think kind of qualifies me to be able to give my opinion on how it flies. So I hope that you believe me when I tell you that this thing just takes your FPV flying experience to an unreal level. Every time I fly it, I get a buttery smooth flight with more than enough power to be able to get me out of most situations. And the best part of all of that is that every time I know exactly how it's going to perform. Now, when it comes to limitations, this is where your personal usage is going to make it vary a little bit. For me, I don't perform heavy freestyle and instead just focus on getting a cinematic styled FPV shot. That means that super fast maneuvers and sudden throttle changes are not high on the priority list. The requirements for my type of flying is that the drone needs to be fairly quick, responsive while carrying a GoPro, and of course, smooth without major prop wash. And thankfully, these three things are easily ticked off with this drone. So if your primary objective is similar to mine, good luck finding a fault with this drone. Now, something that has heavily assisted with the whole flight experience is actually DJI's camera system. The fact that you can see everything clear as day and crisp quality is a relieving feature, honestly. It allows me to be able to fly in any situation and not have to worry about branches popping out of nowhere or flowers or whatever it might be. 
It gives me more confidence. Now, a real major downside that I had with my previous two drones was the batteries. My micro drone lasted all but six minutes and even less when I put the little GoTo camera onto it. And my CineWoop lasted around about the same time with a GoPro on it. I was running an 1100 milliamp hour battery on the CineWoop, but I unfortunately could not trust that drone to carry anything heavier because every time I brought the drone back, the motors were genuinely so hot you couldn't touch them. On the Evoke F5, however, I run 1100 milliamp hour batteries and 1300 milliamp hour batteries and boy oh boy, are they just a dream? As a general with my GoPro mounted onto the drone, I can get a good 10 minutes or so with the 1100 milliamp hour battery and then bump that up to about 12 minutes or so with the 1300 milliamp hour battery. Oh, and I also noticed that the motors never get too hot to touch. Like, you can bring the drone back, touch the motors and, and they're maybe slightly warm, but that would be the max. The thing that really tops it all off is not just how it looks through the goggles, but how the drone actually looks in general. This is a seriously sexy looking drone in the daytime and it gets even better at night thanks to the LED strips. They're all completely configurable through Betaflight which is a really fun feature to have because you can make it rainbow, you can make it you know, change with the battery status, you can make it a solid color, whatever. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. Also, unlike a lot of other FPV drones out there, the Evoke actually rocks these side panels which are fairly lightweight and they just cover up the electronics which not only helps make it look a lot cleaner but it actually kind of assists if it starts to rain or you know you crash into dirt or something all that crap doesn't get pushed into the electronics if you want to pick one of these up for yourself i personally bought mine directly through iFlight's website which was again another great experience so i put that link down in the description box below otherwise thanks for watching subscribe so by this stage you're ready to try out a simulator realistically you don't need the drone or the goggles to do this i just personally like to have those when i was getting started as it was kind of like taunting inspiration every day i would think to myself damn it i've got a drone here but i have no idea how to fly it's wasting my space it's wasting my money but i can't use it so you know it's damn well time to get on the simulator and practice there are however multiple fpv drone sims that exist some of which are free and others that cost well quite a lot so which one is the ultimate FPV simulator to get started with? A few days ago, I hosted a two hour live stream where I tested over $100 worth of the most popular FPV simulators. After two hours of discussing, exploring, and playing each of the six simulators, I did come to the conclusion that there is indeed a clear winner. That winner, however, is beaten by a couple of others in a few subcategories. Best training program, easiest to use, and most fun. So I started off by testing a free to play sim called FPV Skydive. Do keep in mind that this is free because it actually Tops one of the paid for sims that we're going to cover shortly. Now firstly I tested the freestyle aspects of things which were alright. The physics were meh, the maps probably did need a bit of work and there was really no fun elements to you know dive or go through things that much. I then tested the racing aspects of things. You could more or less see where you should be flying and they did incorporate the racing into the maps itself which at least keeps it half interesting. So I then moved on to test the training side of things. The training was very text heavy but it did do a good job at you know getting somebody started and it locked off certain aspects of the drone to help a beginner understand what each individual stick movement does. So overall as a simulator it wasn't a terrible experience and because it's free if you have no budget at all I'd probably recommend it to you. The next sim on my list was FPV Free Rider, which can be purchased for $7.60. Now immediately starting off with the main menu, it did visually appear to be worse than the free sim that we just tested, and unfortunately, it was worse, the whole simulator. The freestyle is super boring, the maps are tiny, the physics are pretty meh, and the racing was unfortunately no better. Then to top it all off, I couldn't actually find a training lesson anywhere. No training program, no beginner's part, nothing. So it kind of feels like a bit of a waste of money. It's just really confusing to me because I've seen some reviews on it that absolutely blow it out of the water and say how they've purchased it three times or whatever. Yeah, I'd, I'd why? Next up in my testing was the DRL sim. Now to give you a bit of backstory here, this is actually the simulator that I have personally used the most and that I went from zero to wherever I'm at now with. It cost $12.40, which is around $5 more than the last sim we just tested, FPV Freerider. Anyways, to kick things off, I went into freestyle flying on a map that I've never flown on before. And thankfully, I got the same experience that I am very much so used to, which is a fun, entertaining, and smooth time. The physics to me are pretty good. However, as mentioned in my live stream by a viewer, Cliff, he says that they feel a little bit floaty in comparison to real world flying, which is completely fair to say, and I just want to put another opinion in there. Anyways, after that, I tried a bit of racing, which I don't generally do much of, but I did really like the red line that guides you through and just the way that you can visibly see each of the gates to go through. So 
Big thumbs up to DRL for the racing side of things. They offer two training or onboarding programs, the first of which wasn't actually around when I was starting out, so it's really cool to see them continually improving on something that I already think is probably the best in the game. So yeah, DRL sim, I was definitely feeling this one, however we still did have three even more expensive simulators to test. Speaking of which, coming in at $20.50, is the trip simulator. I actually covered the sim on a live stream about six months ago when it first came out I think onto Mac so I had a bit of fun with it but I haven't played it since. So to start off I went straight into trip mode which I'm pretty sure is just another way to say freestyle mode and for those of you who don't know this entire simulator is built on what's called Unreal Engine 5. Basically put it's a game development platform that gives the developer a chance to create insane graphics and you know create a great game. You can probably see too that straight off the bat this is definitely the case for the sim simulator it just looks stunning that is however a massive issue for me on my macbook m1 it just really cannot handle the graphics of this game whatsoever so i then moved on to the racing and personally for me i love how it looked the gates lit up and you could pretty happily see where you need to go next this however is where the fun stops because i then moved to the training program and dear god do not train on this if your life depends on it. It's honestly at the point where I think it's so difficult that if you are a beginner trying this out, you may very well just end up quitting and not trying again. There are no movement locks, there's no dumbing down of the sensitivity, so you're at full sensitivity the whole time. And uh, to make it even better, the text has a whole bunch of spelling and grammar errors throughout it, which isn't what you'd expect from a $20 simulator. So I'll give the trip simulator a massive thumbs up for experience, but a massive thumbs down for the training. Next up I headed into a very popular sim that I've honestly never tried before. That sim is called Liftoff and it costs $30. Now I did also add on an additional pack here called the Slipstream Pack for $5.20 which brings the overall cost of the simulator to $35.20. Basically the Slipstream Pack adds in elements like chasing cars and massive trucks, planes, you name it. So I definitely think it's a worthy addition. Anyways to start me off I went and did some free flying around one of the non-Slipstream maps and immediately was just hit with basically a perfect combo of the fun experience of DRL and the beautiful graphics of Trip. Just perfectly combined. And then not only that, the physics here, they've just got to be the best that I've tested so far. After this, I headed over to the racing, which was good, but I did have one big gripe of actually being able to visibly see where you're going next. The arrows were pretty confusing and it just didn't really scream out fun to me. Maybe you can just get used to that as you fly more on liftoff. Now usually I'd go and test out the training mode, but we'll get to that in a second because there's actually a third exclusive mode called freestyle mode, but it's not quite the same as everyone else's. This freestyle mode actually allows you to go in, perform tricks, do dives, go through spaces, and you get points for it. Now that doesn't sound crazy cool, but holy crap, does it actually make freestyling on simulators so much more fun? Now this does happen to be where my excitement kind of leaves a little bit because in my opinion, the training lessons are a bit subpar. They're just videos and then you sort of semi-integrate them into the game itself, but not quite because the videos are just hosted on YouTube. So it feels a bit disconnected and I definitely think they could improve this a lot, but I guess it does help you learn, it's just a different style of learning and not personally as interactive as DRL was. So overall this simulator definitely is getting very high up there on the rankings but we still have one more simulator to go that is more expensive yet. Introducing Velocidrone, the most expensive simulator at $32.30. Now again I also bought an additional pack called the Freestyle Pack which introduces the same elements as the Liftoff Slipstream Pack but that pack came in at $9.50 bringing the total to $41.80. So that's getting pretty up there for a simulator, you know? Anyways, that aside, same as all the other sims, I went into freestyle mode and tested that out. Straight off the bat, I do love how the quad flies in it. It feels probably better than liftoff, I'd say. It's very, very realistic. They've got the physics nailed. But that's honestly the only positive thing I can say about this sim when I compare it to everything else. For me, the graphics are pretty mediocre. It's very expensive. It takes up something like 37 gigabytes of space on your computer, which is a big, big game. And then to put a cherry on top, 
there's no training lessons whatsoever either. So that brings us on to the simulator that I conclude as the best FPV sim for 2023. Starting off with the subcategories, the best training program easily goes to DRL sim. That means that if you're a newbie, look no further than that and just go and purchase it. It's super cheap in comparison to a lot of the others and it really does offer the most immersive and most educational experience possible for starting out. The next subcategory is the easiest to use sim, which goes to liftoff. It's pretty simplistic, but also very feature rich, which is a telltale sign of a great user interface. And then the final subcategory is the most fun simulator, and I'm gonna give that to Trip FPV. I would honestly give liftoff the same subcategory too, but for the sake of the humongous maps and the hyper-realism of the experience within Trip, I do think it deserves this, and it is a a lot of fun to play if only it actually worked on my MacBook. So with all that in mind now, you may be wondering what the top FPV simulator is for 2023. And after multiple hours of researching and testing, although it may be a bit pricey, this title belongs to Liftoff. So yeah, let me know down below if you agree and uh, also make sure to subscribe. Okay, I get it. You want to actually fly now. Just so you're aware, there are four main FPV niches to get involved in and everyone probably has a different goal. Do you want to just fly for fun? to film cinematic videos, to get competitive in racing. In my opinion, there is just one niche that is actually a must for everybody to get involved in at first, as it's gonna set you up to succeed in pretty much any other niche within the hobby. This is freestyle, this is long range, this is racing, and this is cinematic, but which one is the best niche for you to start your FPV journey in? I started within the cinematic niche, meaning my motives were based solely around getting some dope video shots and nothing more. Although this did work for me eventually and got me where I am today within the space, I don't actually think it's the best place to start and wouldn't recommend it for a beginner. To get you going, let's run you through each of the main niches within FPV drones, what the benefits and drawbacks of them all are, and then which one I think is best for you. To kick us off, let's start with cinematic flying. Now, cinematic flying is exactly what it sounds like. You fly with the intent of filming some really cool video footage like capturing the scenery or chasing a drift car around a track. Generally, there isn't too much flipping around and performing difficult maneuvers, however, throttle control is really important to keep your drone low and close to the ground. It's actually a lot easier than you might think to get those swooping cinematic shots or even a smooth dive off a cliff. Furthermore, it's quite a limitless skill to learn as you can start off getting the easy shots and then move on to the tighter, closer, and riskier shots later down the track. Another benefit of flying with the intent of filming is that as soon as you get home, run your footage through a stabilization software, you then get to watch back over it and get all giddy and excited. I can't even remember the amount of times I used to do this where I'd shoot a bunch of shots and then just be absolutely amped to see them on the computer screen as soon as the shoot was over. Honestly, it gets even more exciting when you can start showing your family and friends the footage and then furthermore post it to your socials as well. It does have its drawbacks however, with the biggest one nearly causing me to leave the hobby altogether. That big drawback is lack of community and flying with others. More often than not, you go out to film on an early sunrise or out on the mountains away from civilization. The solo experience can be a soothing time, but mentally I found that it took its toll on me and eventually nearly made me put down the controller indefinitely. The other main drawback for me is the cost of adding the GoPro to your quad. It's not a necessity that you need a GoPro specifically, but for me, it's the best looking footage and it's really the only way that I'd want to go before heading into the cine lifters with professional cameras. A one-off cost would be durable, however, unfortunately when I was getting started I went through four GoPros by crashing my drones. I still crash by the way, but that's all part of the fun. The second niche which is a similar vibe to cinematic flying is long range. It's here that you get to fly through vast landscapes and fill in those explorer needs. This is the sort of flying that some will class as the same as cinematic, but I really believe the feeling of gliding down a mountain or even just getting up close and personal with the top of a waterfall is really just something so unique to this niche. A massive positive for these drones is if you fly something like a 3-inch Explorer and run lithium-ion batteries, your flight time is ridiculously long. I'm talking sometimes sitting around 20 to 25 minutes. That means more time for you behind the goggles and less money shelling out on 10 extra battery packs. Unfortunately, with all this in mind, long-range flying is actually severely illegal in some countries due to their line of sight laws. That means for a lot of people, it's not actually a possibility to take part in this niche aspect of the hobby. It also means the community surrounding it is either non-existent or people keep it on the down low for obvious reasons. It's always a good idea to make sure you're operating within your country's drone laws, so giving long range a miss might be the best for some people here. Alright, up next is racing. This is a completely different vibe from anything cinematic or slow. In fact, it's quite literally the exact opposite. Racing is either against yourself or other people, consists of flying through gates and around flags, 
and doing those tight turns as fast as you possibly can. This is seriously one of the most fun and sustainable niches within FPV as you're surrounding yourself with like-minded people. That generally means from the get-go of meeting someone new, you always have something in common to talk about and can actually become friends really quickly. It's also a really competitive way of flying whether you're just trying to do your best to beat your own time or whether you're actually racing against other pilots on the same track. Not only is flying in such different ways a new skill to learn, but so is learning the ins and outs of building and fixing your quad as you crash and break things. It can be quite the challenge sometimes, but thankfully again, the community is seriously always there to help you out even if it's just a simple mistake. There is literally little to no judgement and everyone is always excited to help you learn. Everything does of course have its cons, although I'd say these are able to be counted with how positive the community side of things is. Obviously, you're going fast and you're flying close to things, so your risk of hitting stuff at high speeds is very high, and you're more than likely going to break your quad. That means it can suck up your time, money, and especially your patience when things don't go to plan, or they don't work like you think they should, so be aware if you have a low patience threshold like me. Talking about the building side of things, it can be a bit limiting building a race-specific quad, as for a lot of races you aren't able to use a DJI video system. I'm sure that there are many reasons behind it, but I know for the fact that the biggest one is the interference that it causes for every other system out there. I personally experience it when flying with my friends, and even that still with all of the precautions possible taken. Now, the final drawback for racing, which is funnily enough one of the reasons I never wanted to start, is the steep learning curve in all aspects. Both the building of the quad and the flying process can and will take a while to get your head around, and you'll need to learn a lot, but I personally think at the end of the day, the satisfaction of knowing you've built something that flies is pretty damn awesome. The final main style of flying that we're covering today is called freestyle. This is the type of flying that I'd class as more just for fun, but don't get me wrong here, there is still a lot to learn within it and a lot of skill required to be good. If cruising after work and going for a fun flight sounds more like you, then freestyle is probably a really good route to try out. You get the fast experience of flying close to things, but also the smooth feeling of performing tricks, dives and flips. It's still a viable option to film and then share with too, as once you get smooth and hitting close call gaps, it can be really epic footage that is actually worth showing to others. Thankfully, freestyle has been around for quite a while too, and alongside racing is what I'd say the most common niche. That means you get the benefit of having other pilots around you who you can most likely meet up with and fly together with. If you aren't able to find anyone else though, it can have the exact same effect as cinematic flying had for me getting started, where the loneliness takes its toll. Similar to racing here, once you start to push your limits, you're most likely going to start breaking parts as well, which means there is the same learning barrier and money aspect to this too. This is still a solid option to start out with and is actually the way that a lot of pilots fly as there is plenty to learn, it offers the same skill sets as racing and can still have a community based around it. So now that you know what each of the main niches are within FPV, you're completely free to decide where you think you should start out, but if I can give you my biggest piece of advice, it's to start where the community is. For the majority of people, that's going to mean starting out with racing. It's, in my opinion, the best way to see yourself progress, it's the easiest place to ask every question you ever have, and it's really a whole different flying experience with other people, even if they're miles better. Trust me, I would know. The other alternative here is if you find that you know of a few freestyle or cinematic pilots in your area, I'm going to seriously recommend that you try to connect with them and go out to fly with them. Sometimes it can be hard to find others, and that's exactly what I struggled with just over a year ago. However, the moment I tried the racing scene is the moment everything changed for me. Speaking of which, I had the absolute privilege of asking some of the best drone racers in New Zealand and even Australia what their secrets were to success. And they told me so much stuff that I'd wish I'd known before I got started. Thankfully for you, I actually recorded these secrets so you can learn earlier rather than later from the best. I have to spend the past three days at a national FPV racing event where pilots traveled from all over New Zealand and even Australia to compete, including none other than drone racing champion Thomas Bitmarta. So I'd say that this is the perfect place to be interviewing top FPV pilots and essentially finding out how to win races. So we're going to start off with... Gang Gang. Gang gang. How long have you been flying it through there? Like as a gen? Um I got into it in twenty sixteen, so we'd be pro we'd be like between six and seven years now. Yeah. Is that racing that whole time? Um, I started off with the goal of racing because I saw that on YouTube. Got into racing, bit of freestyle, and then have now like gone into doing a lot of filming with it as well. The satisfaction of racing comes from just like 
smooth lines, smooth flying, and just like getting really good lap times. And also when you're filming, you're kind of just on your own. But then when you're here, it's just this full on nerd fest with all of your mates. To t top on what you were saying before about smooth lines and good lap times around the track. Yeah. How do you train for that? Like, how do you personally train for that side of things? I go to a field with like a couple of mates or just by myself and set up obstacles that I've seen in big races and kind of do drills on those. Yeah, I always focused on being smooth and it's almost like modern family, Phil Dunphy. I remember he said, as they're trying to leave the house quickly, he's like, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Kind of trying to like slow your brain down enough so that you're thinking ahead to where you need to be after you exit a gate. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sweet ass. So what is your name and how long have you been flying FPV? My name is Thomas Bitmata or BMS Thomas in the drone racing scene. And I've been flying FPV since December 2011. 2011. So what are we talking there? That's... Uh, I'm going to let you do the maths. 13 years? 12? 12? 12? Yes. I don't do... I'm 12 to 13 years. My math brain is a uh, toasted. Bit. That's that's okay. But what isn't a toaster is your goddamn flying skills. And so how do you train for racing as a general? Okay, there's all sorts of training. So I've got drill training that I do. Maybe I want to focus on a specific element. One example of that directly related to this event, the triple gates with the flags. I spent a day right to set up that one element and just practice that whole thing the whole time, right? It's a new element, something that I'm unfamiliar with. Let's get some sick time behind it and just focus on that one section. A little bit brutal. It's one of those things. I can only do so much drill training, right? Like it, it, it's hard work. It gets to a point where it gets tiring. So for, with that, I mix it up with normal race practice, setting up technical tracks, fun tracks, a new one I'll be doing with dad, which is really fun. We do spec racing. So we have two identical setup quads. And when we race, we like handicap as we go to keep balance it out every two races. And what we do is we split up the elements equally. So we've got six gates, two dive gates, two flags. Dad gets a flag, two gates, and a dive gate, I get the same. And then we have a, like a start gate, and then like a gate on the other side. Right. And we basically toss a coin for the rotation of the track, clockwise, any clockwise. Toss a coin for who gets which side of the track, and we each build a half. It keeps it really fun. It's one of those things, we do that maybe once a week, but it just keeps you fresh. Because the tracks, if you do, do fly your own tracks all the time, it's almost like you have your own like rhythm. If that makes sense, your own style. And if you don't taste sort of everyone else's style, sort of sample it, everyone else's pacing, I think you almost, not just say stale, but like you almost lock into only your style of flying and all tracks feel weird. You limit yourself, right? That would sort of be like, you'd be limiting yourself by only focusing on your way of flying and, and, and instead of trying to focus on other people's ways of flying and like improving on that. Correct, yeah. And you'll find that where if you, say, are a part of a local club, you might find that, say, when the club organizer builds a track versus one of the pilots builds a track, they've got, like, a unique feel, a distinct sort of signature to themselves. G getting a sample of all those signatures and having that variety... Actually, if I did have to sum up my training, it is variety. It's doing a bit of everything. Um, that's, I think, what keeps me sort of feeling fresh and sort of always on the improve. With the variety, does simulator training come into play there? Yes, this is something I've only picked up since the pandemic times. So I used to fly the sim pre-pandemic, you know, when simulators were new, so FPV, Freerider, and Liftoff. Then did a bit of DRL in 2016, DRL sim. Then 2017 and onwards, I basically dropped it for whatever reason. But when the pandemic came, I had a bit of time where obviously we're not flying or anything. So I started picking up Velocidrone. Now, at the moment, I'll do half an hour to an hour a day, five days a week. That's that's uh that's quite a, that's quite a lot of training on just the simulator and as you're doing that as well as your other training too, right? That's correct. Yeah. So I try to though some days I'll miss it. Obviously, if you know I train for a long time, we go out for dinner or something, pick up dinner on the way home, it might just get to the point it's bedtime when I get home, right? So in that case, there's no point staying up late and killing my sleep. I'll just go to bed. But if I can, I'll try to do it. I really like the simulators because, especially within the case of Velocidrone, you get community-made tracks and. Once again, it's that different styles, usually because it's a simulator, they're more technically complex than a real track. And it's almost getting your brain in the rhythm of learning tracks, memorizing, not getting lost, and then even just getting used to the sort of the rough stick movements of just throwing the sticks around in sort of weird positions that you wouldn't normally. That way, when you come to something like this, which is really technically complex in the real world, it's sort of less boring. You're used to sort of banging the sticks around and just having confidence in your inputs. Okay, well to wrap up, how do you win a race? 
It is to make the least value in mistakes than anyone else. What do you mean by that? Okay. So I've had races where I have botched up the qualifying, barely made it through the heats, and then performed really well in the finals, right? And taken a win, right? Uh, equally, in MultiGP Champs 2019, did a really strong qualifying, performed really well through all the heats. In the finals, I had a mid-air with Vanover and Drobot Racer. I was able to claw back and get a second place, which is really sick, right? But my one mistake that I made in that final was way higher, like, penalty as far as where it placed me than a whole bunch of little mistakes elsewhere. So it's sort of, if you can imagine, there's like an optimal path to, like, victory. The game of racing, the how to win, is to try and deviate from that optimal as little as possible. Epic. Thank you. Can you please introduce yourself and, and how long you've been flying for? Yo, I'm Seth, also known as Crypto FPV. Uh, I fly drones, been flying for seven years. Is that racing for those seven years? Uh, yeah, racing and freestyle and anything. Lovely, lovely. Okay, how do you train for racing? So how would you train either daily or for an event like this sort of thing? We run weekly races here. So um, every Wednesday night we do racing. So that's a great spot to go from being complete noob to complete pro. Um, but simulator can't be beat really. Rain or shine, you can jump on your laptop from anywhere um and fly any track anywhere in the world so um no nah, simulators are awesome can get a bit boring but you know um still a real real good tool real good tool. simulator of choice got to be velocidrone i started on liftoff liftoff was all right um sort of a bit before velocidrone got popular but velocidrone's racing can't really be beat what is the best way to win a race god what a question the golden question actually get thomas to fly it for you yeah if you're not Thomas, start slow is my best advice. Well, you're going to have a first pack of the day, always. Um, my main bit of advice is just to get around the track on your first pack. Don't try, do anything crazy. Get, don't even look at lines. Just get through every gate because that's a starting point. And from there, you can work your way out. If you, if you have a little bit of a bobble, totally fine. But I just find mentally, for me, if I can make one lap, I know I can at least do that and then I can build from there. So... I love this. This is exactly, exactly what Evan Turner with Heads Up in said. Like, exactly on that. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And happy racing. What is your name and how long have you been within the FPV space? Good question. Uh, I'm Kevin. Um, mostly known by Quato. I've been doing about six years now. Racing for those six years? No, so I started out just doing freestyle. I was one of those people that just got into it by just doing only freestyle. And I was actually against racing for about two years. Why were you against, why were you against it? Oh, well, it just seemed like too many rules and all that kind of stuff. But then when I actually finally tried to race once, I was like, you know, well, this is amazing. And just the camaraderie kept me coming back. And now that's all I've been doing. I don't even freestyle anymore. How do you train for, for a racing event? That's, yeah. So probably a few years ago when I was first really getting into racing, I would probably go out three or four times, maybe even five times a week for a couple of hours and just set up gates and just pump out lap after lap and I'd even do just drills with like one obstacle or something and just pump that out pack after pack and just really drill the stuff into you to the point where you're not thinking about doing it um but now that I'm at a more comfortable flying level I tend not to do too much real life practicing now I pretty much only practice on Velocidrone now I, really I'll practice on Velocidrone and then I'll go out and race at the club with my real ones yeah that's crazy so when you mean race at the club are you talking that's like you know weekly racing yeah, so that's uh, our club drone race in Wellington, and we do we race like once a month. How do you win a race? So basically, from what I can see, from like especially the really top guys, when it comes to the pressure situations like an event like this, is um, just consistency. Where the difference between the very top guys that are winning events and the guys uh, just below them, who might get similar lap times, is the consistency. So they'll be they'll be putting in. For example, like a 17 second lap, five times, six times in a row. And that guy might be doing like one or two. And, it's, and really all it comes down to is training. So you've got the best guys in the world. They're just training countless packs daily. And it's almost a full-time job if you want to get to that point. But that might put some people off. But also you don't have to be at the top of the game to have the best time. Exactly. Yeah. You've got to come to an event like this. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm not even racing at this event. And it's like... It's just a whole lot of fun seeing everyone else's skill levels and 
And also seeing like yourself, you've broken your personal record. How many times today? I just did it uh, three times today. Yeah. Yeah. And we're just experiencing crashes as we're, we're going around here too. We've got some big doozy crashes going on. We've had a few written off quads. Have you yet written up any today? No, I've been solid. That's what you like to hear then. Yeah. Okay, lovely, <laughs> lovely. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Um, and happy racing. Thank you. Do you want to introduce yourself and how many years you've been flying FPV for? Uh, my name is Bryce. My pilot handle is Rizla. I've been flying FPV for probably about four years now. Is that racing for those four years or did you start off with freestyle? Or? Yeah, started off like with just little micro quads and then got a, like a really, really fast three inch that was running on 4S. It could go, you know, 180, 200K. And I was like, okay, this this is insanely cool. How do you personally train yourself to, to come to this event? It's different because like you can fly at the park or by yourself and train, but then coming here and like at the same time you're hearing all these other quads, you you got to really know how to filter out the other sounds and trust what you know and you see in your quad and not focus on sounds or anything. You just got to kind of lock in and remember what you're doing. But yeah. For this, did you go to parks and stuff or were you like primarily within simulators or flying with mates? Like what was sort of your go-to? Um, well, me and my mate Blair, we um, started a club called Eastside FPV in Auckland. So we um been hosting race days, but we haven't even been able to fly this year because weather, then floods and cyclones. And it's just like, oh. Yes, on Thursday, I had a little warm up and it was the first time flying the five inch this year. But Velocity Drone is always, always a good place to have some practice because the track's already loaded up on there. And at least when you come here, you you know. But you, you do obviously have to adjust a little bit as the lines are going to be slightly different. It's not, you know, when you do the real thing. But yeah, my biggest thing was, you know, when racing with other people, just focus on what I see, you know, n nothing else. So more about what you see and less about anything that you're hearing at that yeah, point. For sure, for sure. Because sometimes you, you listen out for your quad or you hear someone else's quad, like if they've got a bent prop and you think, hey, I've got a bent prop. And, but you well know you haven't even hit anything. So yeah, yeah you just kind of, get over it a little bit how do you win a race kind of brings it back to like before you got to focus on yourself and like fly how you know you can like fly to your strengths like don't overdo it because oh my god it's race day i've got to be faster fly your game get to the finish line worry about who you did beat or didn't beat at the end you know just focus on yourself thank you no worries mate oh we're going for the shake we are but appreciate it appreciate it happy racing now that you're primed with all the knowledge and equipment you could possibly need to get going you're going to need to actually get out there and start learning as you know i started off with cinematic flying but nearly three years later i'm still here learning new things pretty much every single day in fact i decided a few months ago to train like a pro drone racer for 30 days straight if you want to see improvement this is something that you need to give a try right now. Have you ever just sat there in pure awe watching the DVR of some world champ drone racer ripping around a track at the speed of light? Ever notice just how calm and laser focused they seem to be? These are the guys that are putting hours upon hours every single day to hone their craft, like hone in their skills. 30 days ago, I sat here thinking to myself, what would happen if I tried the same? What would happen if I tried my absolute best to train my drone racing skills every single day? Would I really improve or does it come down to more than just practice? Is it natural talent that I lack? Do I have the focus, reaction time and discipline necessary? These were the sort of questions that I had fogging my mind. So instead of ignoring them and allowing them to exist as questions, I did decide to find out some answers. Previous to this episode, I've actually had the opportunity to interview two world champion drone racers who both have extremely notable advice that I have simply never applied. Who are the people that are succeeding? It's the people who are doing things that other people are not. They're the ones who are working the hardest at coming out with the next best product, working the hardest at trying to be the next big thing. You need to fly a lot, but more important than flying a lot, you need to have fun. Go all in. If you believe in it, because that's how you win. If you're having fun, you're gonna fly more. You're gonna fly more, you're gonna get better. You're gonna get better, you're gonna have more fun. That competitive nature inside of me just made me push really, really hard for an extended period of time consistently uh, before you know, eventually I started to see results. In an attempt to close a substantial gap between myself and those pro level racers, I made the decision to dedicate 30 days straight to FPV drone racing. To do this, I formulated a three phase plan, which was as follows. Phase one would be for the first seven days where I'd have one simulated training session of an hour on any track I like. But phase two would take us through the following 14 days where I'd be swapping that simulator session out for a real life fly around with gates. This was of course gonna need to be weather dependent and because it's winter here in New Zealand, 
my hopes couldn't be too high. Phase three would then take us into the final week where I'd be honing in solely on this year's Australian Nationals track with a daily session on the simulator, plus a setup of the small aspects of the track in real life. This isn't actually the first time that I've tried an experiment of similar nature to this. About three months ago, I tried solely simulator practice for racing over a period of five days. Now, although it did show some small signs of improvement, I learned more from the experience as a whole rather than from the training itself. What I mean here is after that episode was released, you guys mentioned I should change my rates and honestly, that was something I'd never considered to be of importance. Since then, however, I've changed my rates from whatever the stock ones were to Evan Turner's 533 rates. This change improved my ability to fly more smoothly and have way more control over the sticks. So lesson one, if you plan to do the same as me, is to remember to set up your rates first. Now, in order to be able to accurately measure my progress over the 30 days, I needed to start off day one with a controlled trial session. To make sure as many variables are controlled, I'd be doing the trial session within the Velocidrone simulator. Within the simulator, I'd be able to use the 533 switchback quad, the same battery dynamics, and the exact same track setup that I planned to use on day 30 of this experiment. So I threw myself into the deep end a bit and gave myself 30 minutes to land my best consecutive three laps on the Australian Nationals 2023 track, I had previously flown the track in the prior week, so I knew the route to take, but to make sure I was feeling fresh, I went in with absolutely no warm up whatsoever. As a starting point, 52.874 seconds over three laps was actually pretty satisfying. It did, however, spark my curiosity to find out what I would be like in 30 days time. I shave off a second, five seconds, 20 seconds. Honestly, I had no idea. My first three days, however, were just as I expected them to be, just rinsing and repeating. Practice, find a new track, practice some more, find another track. You get the picture. The end of day three, however, was where I hit my first brick wall. Yeah, I know, I managed to make it a solid three days before something went wrong. That something was my controller's plastic gimbal snapping. For the past few weeks, it had felt like something was a little bit off with the right stick, but just couldn't quite pinpoint what the issue was. I, of course, ordered a new gimbal, which then took an entire four days to get to me, because all of this happened on a Thursday night and things don't move quickly in the post over weekends. Monday did come around, however, and I got the new gimbal installed into my controller and then completed days four, five, six, and seven simulator training. That brings us on to phase two of my experiment. For the following 14 days, I would be practicing in real life with my actual race quad instead of on the simulator. The only limiting factor that I'd be able to experience here was shitty weather conditions, but those hopefully few days would simply be replaced with an hour on the sim. Now, if you thought that I was already off to a rocky start in week one, the next two weeks would be an absolute living hell. This rain, it's not working out. You can see it is just, it's actually heavy as heck. And to top it all off as well, the controls on this thing seem to be super off center. Don't ask me why it's doing that. Something probably needs to be recalibrated. So, back to the simulator. This rain, yeah, it's just getting heavier, isn't it? After that lovely first outing, I figured that I actually needed to recalibrate my controller, which was the cause of the tilt issue. Moving forwards though, we come into what might just be the first truly positive part of the experiment. Day nine. For the first time, I had blue skies, a working controller, and currently a drone that flew. I'm actually really excited though, after recalibrating the controller last night, the quad should, in theory, fly perfectly fine today. So I've brought two flags, and we're just gonna see if we can actually I don't know, fly around some gates and just get used to flying in real life and not just on a sim. I'm actually really excited, so here's to the start of finally flying in real life again. Day 10, we were back to square one with the weather. I wasn't able to fly outside again, but it did happen to be another great day where I finally nailed three consecutive laps on the Australian Nats track, coming in at just over 43 seconds total. That means in the past 10 days worth of training, I'd managed to pull my time down by about nine and a half seconds. That's a solid second per day, which made things start to look really promising for me. Day 11, I drove a few hours down to my dad's place for the weekend, so I didn't have any gates with me, but we did get a bit of a break in the weather, and I managed to sneak a flight in just before the sunset. I was actually really surprised with how well the little analog camera was holding up in the low light. Like, it was getting pretty damn dark, but kept on powering through like a champ. 
Day 12, however, after three days of positive vibes, came and slapped me in the face with a plate full of issues that honestly had the potential to screw up the remaining half of the entire experiment. As usual, the first flight went great. I was boosting around a bit of a bando, honestly having a really fun time, and it only ended because I had to bring the quad back in to clear a water droplet. The moment I took it up for pack two, I noticed my vision was becoming blurry. My first thought was, oh, the water droplet must have smudged the lens, but also as usual, I was wrong. The lens has come unscrewed, so it's not very ideal. So I opened the quad up to access the camera, and in doing so, I actually ripped the wires off of the camera itself. I'm an absolute idiot, huh? Absolutely caked the camera. We're, uh, we're out of flying for a couple of days with this at least. Not all was lost though. I did manage to resolder the tiny three wires back on and well, it worked to an extent and I got my camera feedback. To end my second week of the experiment off with a bang, I had two solid days of real life training. If it looks polar freezing right now, it's because it is. I managed to actually fix the quad as well. Really surprised my soldering skills allowed for that. So hopefully that stays in place today. Everything else is good to go. My fingers are so cold, but we have flag, flag, two gates, and I'll kind of figure out what exactly I'm gonna be doing flight wise when I get out and fly. Now, if you remember back to day 12, I mentioned that I was served a plate full of issues that had the potential to screw up the remaining half of the experiment. Yeah, well, about that. We're back at square one again. The quad now doesn't have a camera feed at all. It wasn't connecting Crossfire today or the VTX either. And then suddenly it started up and the camera was just grayed out, so. Whatever that means, I've ordered a new camera and we've got a completely different camera coming in. Probably won't get sent out till Monday, so I might get it for Wednesday. I spent the next few days training back in Velocidrone, waiting for that camera to arrive so I could solve my issues once and for all. Even longer than I predicted though, it took until day 21 to get the camera into my hands. All right, the little camera has arrived. Look how cute that is. So we're gonna have to pull the drone apart resolder on a new camera and hope that everything works perfectly after that because if it doesn't then we've got other issues. I was so hopeful for myself that this would be an easy fix and I absolutely fucked it, didn't I? Hopefully it's not one of these because nowhere in New Zealand right now has got a Crossfire 69 in stock anywhere. Everything had gone to complete shit and I couldn't afford to really waste any more time fixing the drone up. So I decided that the best I could do was to knuckle down to Velocidrone, fly the Australian National Track every day for the last week and just see what progress I could actually make. So 30 days ago, I sat in this exact chair on this exact simulator with this exact controller and went into this 30 minutes cold, absolutely no practice whatsoever. This is the final test. This is to really see if this 30 days of everyday practice does anything. Today, I'm aiming to get the fastest time ever. I've got 30 minutes, basically starting from the second that I click quick start and that'll be me. So without further ado, let's try and get a fastest score ever. Well, 
39 point something seconds. It's not my best time. My best time of my practices got down to 37 or something like that. So we're two seconds slower. Today's probably the worst that I've been on the simulator and it's definitely got to do with the stress and the anxiety behind having 30 days of training leading up to this one moment. I'll be real here, the disappointment in myself was thankfully short-lived as I soon came to realize that a 13 and a half second speed increase between day one and day 30 was actually fairly significant. I can honestly say that I gave this last month at least one hour of practice every day, which for me was the most time that I could actually dedicate over those 30 days. But in reality, it all swings around full circle for me to understand that these top racers are not only super talented, but they also dedicate insane amounts of time to their craft. They practice for hours upon hours every single day for months and even years on end. It's actually helped me understand that much like everything in life, you want to be the best at something, you not only need to outwork everyone else, but you also need to apply consistency and dedication to whatever it is. Look, I can promise you that there were many days during the last month that I didn't have the motivation to train or go out in the cold weather, but because I threw motivation out the window and instead relied on dedication, I managed to show up every day just like I said I would. So if you're sitting there wondering how to get better at racing or simply anything in life, I promise you that it just comes down to hard, dedicated work. Write that down and get your ass out there and we'll see you in the next one. So there you have it. The last thing you need to do right now is just get the hell out there and fly. But before you do, there's a whole bunch of cheap FPV drone gear that's gonna make your experience so much easier and so much more fun. It's also not gonna break the bank in the process. You can watch that video here.